The Forerunners are a race of enigmatic and mysterious beings whom, apart from one known individual and a galaxy full of their megastructures, are now almost entirely absent from the galaxy. The installations they leave behind are massive, beautiful, and awe-inspiring. The nature and history of how they came to be saturated in a noble endeavour to be the stewards of the galaxy and guardians of all life that exists within it. But as we know from our own nature, no species is all good, all kind, all wise, all benevolent. In reality, much of the foreigner's history is stained with the blood of countless beings from countless races. As with any powerful species, their natural duality of good and evil, light and dark, is something they cannot hide and that can be found if you look hard enough. Hey everyone, welcome back to Installation 00 and today we take a look at the 10 most disturbing aspects of the Forerunners. This is not a list of the most heinous of crimes against life that individuals of the Forerunners have perpetrated, but rather common practices undertaken by the Forerunner species at large as part of their culture, sciences and technology. It's always disturbing to look at the most disgusting singular acts performed by the most corrupt and depraved individuals of a culture, but it's all the more unsettling realizing that this list of 10 disturbing practices was openly accepted by the entire culture. It sets a bar of tolerance to gruesome acts and the macabre that suggests that if these were acceptable by most people's standards, what did the worst of them get up to? If you weren't creeped out by the foreigners' known acts of brutality, these 10 practices might just do it for you. So, let's get on and do this. I've spoken at length before about the foreigners' method of energy harvesting that ultimately powers their immense megastructures in a previous video. Link is in the description if you want the full details, but to summarize it, the foreigners utilize energy pulled from the quantum vacuum pylons. This, fundamentally, draws energy from the quantum vacuum of untold quantities of alternate realities. Unknowable quantities of nascent universes are spun up and then aborted, siphoning off their immense energy to feed the requirements of the forerunner megastructures. To put this in simpler terms, the forerunners pull alternate realities or effectively parallel universes, apart. They capture them and deconstruct these universes in an instant, using the abundant energy that fuels their very existence for their own means. Doing this literally destroyed that reality, that parallel universe, any potential, any development, indeed any life contained within, being ripped apart at the quantum level, literally destroying the very foundation of their reality and converting it to raw energy. This is disturbing enough with just that, but when you consider that the mantle of responsibility is based upon the idea that the universe itself is alive, is conscious in a way that we simply cannot comprehend, then you realize that the foreigners were also defiling the very mantle they claimed to uphold in their pursuit of energy. They were killing universal consciousnesses, all the life and potential this alternate reality contained just to power their technology. Imagine being literally torn apart atom by atom, subatomic particle by subatomic particle until you simply cease. Any chance of life, an afterlife, any trace of your past, any instant of your present, and any moment of your future, torn to bits along with the entire reality that surrounds it, being converted into a raw, fundamental energy and then being drawn through to a machine to be siphoned and distributed as a fuel to power a construct of unknowable complexity. This is how the Forerunners harvest their energy. The mantle of responsibility at face value isn't disturbing at all. Protection and shielding of all sentient life in the galaxy from harm. 
But you see, the mantle is subject to interpretation. The original mantle of responsibility as conceived by the precursors, or possibly even just passed to them from whomever or whatever created them, wasn't exactly as the foreigners followed and upheld it. The precursor's mantle was more so to allow life to exist and develop, ebb and flow with the universe's will in an organic cycle of life, advancement, decline, death, and rebirth over and over again. They intervened occasionally in shared knowledge and advancement by means of assisted, accelerated or designed evolution, but ultimately left life to exist on life's terms, allowing the most worthy species of each galaxy they visited to take the mantle of responsibility as they saw it, and continue the precursor's work in their absence. When the foreigners learned they weren't to inherit the mantle and instead would pass to humanity, they began rising against the precursors, their very creators, and striking with a military force so powerful, aggressive, and unexpected that the precursors didn't have chance to respond. They hunted the precursors to near extinction and took the mantle of responsibility for their own. Then they used this to enforce an imperial peace. The mantle, to the foreigners, meant that the foreigners remain at a position of preeminence within the galaxy and forced their protection upon any and all life in the galaxy whether they wanted it or not. And any act of the species under their enforced protection seemed to be contravening their rule or wanting to live by their own terms were immediately viewed as being in defiance of the foreigners and thus in defiance of the mantle itself. This was nearly always met with sudden and decisive action from the foreigners. When humanity chose to live as they desired, developed an alliance with the Sanchoma and began spreading away from the foreigners rule, the foreigner paid a significant amount of attention to them and their activities, with inklings of the age-old resentment of humanity being chosen to carry the mantle, lingering at the edges of the foreigner's intentions. When the Flood ultimately forced the human empire to flee fallen colonies and systems and resettle within foreigner-controlled systems, while also culling Flood-infested foreigner systems, the foreigners didn't take the time to analyse the reasons, or even ask humanity why they were doing this. They moved immediately to war. Despite humanity's gallant efforts, the foreigners utterly destroyed ancient humanity, devolving the remaining populace back to hunter-gatherers and fragmenting their evolutionary profile into dozens of lesser developed species of human. On top of this, they disarmed and quarantined the San Shayum to their home system and composed and analysed the memories of hundreds of ancient humans in a desperate attempt to find a suggested cure to the Flood. The mantle of responsibility was defiled time and time again by the foreigners as they misinterpreted its ideals, stealing it from their creators and the rightful inheritors of the mantle and enforcing their own will across the galaxy with unrelenting military action. It is also reasonable to assume that the precursors, humanity and the San Shayum were not the only victims of this martial peace. They led an authoritarian dictatorship disguised a stewardship of life, both literally and figuratively offering a hand to uplift life, while simultaneously keeping a boot firmly planted on life's throat. A big aspect of foreigner culture was the way in which they refined themselves to be more fitting to a particular purpose within their societal structure. This was achieved by a process called mutation. Mutation was a foreigner term referred to customising biological maturation to new forms or rates, entailing a carefully adjusted combination of genetic engineering, gene therapy and biochemical manipulation. A foreigner's mutation determined the individual's place within their family, maniple, guild and society overall. The process was typically performed between two to five times over the course of an individual's life. In a general sense, this basically means that they genetically manipulated their own bodies during life to tailor their physical form and mind to set structures of their society. They'd mutate themselves even further from their own natural base to be nearly unrecognisable as an individual of their original species. 
manipulars or young foreigners were, in appearance, strikingly close to humans. After several of these mutations, however, the foreigners could grow additional limbs, grow immensely tall, much larger muscles, grow to be stockier, more intelligent, but all of this comes with a cost. Many of the natural aspects of their emotional state were overwritten with cold, hard logic. Smiling and laughter, for example, is something innate in all of us. Laughter is something we just do. It has powerful social implications and allows for us to express a plethora of emotions in an instant. It allows excess emotional energy to overflow and present as something others can interpret and share. To the foreigners, smiling and laughter were seen as archaic and in truth quite revolting and barbaric. It is reasonable to assume other fundamentally essential expressions of emotion were seen with equal levels of disdain. Second to this, the very need to mutate to suit a role reveals not only that the foreigners were somewhat unwilling to undergo the process that is required to action a change. If you wanted to be the world's strongest fan, for example, you'd go to the gym and you'd work out five, six, seven days a week. You'd eat the right food, you'd push yourself, undergo strain and stress and possible injury to force your body to adapt. Over time, with immense levels of will, determination and routine, you get there. Yet the foreigners could simply inject themselves with genetic serum and voila, they're stronger than any human has ever been or likely ever will be. Or, in the words of Ian Malcolm, um, I'll tell you the problem with the scientific power that you're, that you're using here. Uh, it didn't require any discipline to attain it. Further to this, the very fact they mutated to meet certain roles means their society had stagnated. A foreigner could hope to be really only one of four rates. These rates had essentially only one job each. Builders built stuff. Warrior servants fought wars. Miners dug up raw materials. Life workers probably had the most varied job but were basically zoologists, vets and medical doctors all in one. You had the choice of one of these four jobs. That's it. If you wanted to be an artist, nope, no artists. You wanted to be a musician, nope, no music. You wanted to be a YouTuber, nope, no YouTube. You can build stuff, kill stuff, dig up stuff, or heal stuff, that's about it. This stagnation wasn't a recent thing either. Millions of years of foreigner society were bounded by this structure. No room for creativity, no room for personality, no room for being an individual. You were born into a family that performed a certain duty and that was your lot. There is something massively unsettling about a culture that has stagnated and doesn't tolerate or allow individuality, creativity, or curiosity. In fact, the foreigner born Stella makes eternal lasting was born to a builder family, but didn't want to be a builder. He wanted to explore the universe in search of knowledge of the precursors and their artifacts. He was curious, creative, emotionally driven. His father and his rate saw him as a rebellious and somewhat a problem child. His father shipped him off to learn discipline from a minor family in the soul system. By discipline, this basically meant he was sending him to a rate less fortunate than his own to work against his will. It would legitimately be the equivalent of sending a naughty child from the developed world to live with a poor third world family of quarriers for some extended forced physical labor. Any joy, any independence, any creativity harbored in the minds of their youths was squashed out and replaced with, you are this, you will do this, this is all there is, and you are going to accept it. Robbing any child of their chance to be a child is disgusting and disturbing. Robbing a child of their childhood isn't the worst of mutation, however. One particular aspect of the mutation was called pattern transfer. The mutation of an individual would undergo was always patterned after an individual's mentor, typically but not always their parent. This basically means that the individual would receive a copy of the consciousness of their mentor, which would gradually integrate and overwrite their original consciousness over a period of several years, slow enough to appear as a normal developmental change when in reality what was effectively happening 
is the individual was being overwritten with a copy of their mentor, whom would have received the same process from their mentor, and the same from theirs, and so on for millions of years. This means that it is likely that all foreigners alive during this period were simply copies of the foreigners who instigated this system in the first place. No diversity, no natural evolution, no new ideas, no new thoughts, no new mind, and no new perspectives. They would have all been overwritten and destroyed by the mutation process and replaced them with the same consciousness as those who implemented the first mutations in Forerunner history. Their older ideals and mannerisms being perpetuated for generation after generation with no room for change. This is wrong on the level of societal evolution and the progress of any species as time goes on and the values and ideals change, but to literally erase a child's personality over several years while the ego of an ancient decrepit mind slowly takes over their brain like a parasite. In this regard, the foreigners bear some striking similarities to the flood, and really when you think the foreigners made this happen slowly, gradually, over many years, so as to be met with the least resistance possible, being interpreted by the original personality as simply being an organic change, when it was actually a hostile takeover of the body by a parasitic and invasive ego. At least the flood had the decency of being quick and to the point about it. Endurance is a device which contains an extracted personality impression and memories of an individual. These serve a few functions, some being the innermost workings of foreigner automated platforms such as the Monitors and Promethean Knights, while others are used to store the imprint and last memories of an individual who has died. To do this, a foreigner's armour would temporarily store the thoughts, feelings and memories and personality of the foreigner in question for the moments leading up to their death. This could then be transferred from their armour to the durance and given to the family along with some plasma from the immolation of the body, as a sort of epitaph. At face value, this seems like a nice gesture of kindness to the mourning family and a clever way to power their autonomous machines. But when you consider that the imprints are often so complete that the personality itself is actually self-aware, then it becomes troubling. If consciousness continues after death and transfers with the imprint, then the individual who has died is forced to relive the moments before they died over and over and over again until the durance meets its half-life of a million years. While generally speaking foreigners died of old age rather than in traumatic occurrences such as war or violence, meaning the imprint's last memories would likely have been being surrounded by their loved ones and passing peacefully in their bed. The forerunners were not the only species who were imprinted onto durances. Humans were often imprinted onto durances to power Promethean knights and monitors such as 343 Guilty Spark. In the case of the knights, those humans would have been composed. The composition process is levels of disturbing unto its own, but the reality is that the instances of composition we have witnessed aren't exactly events of serenity and acceptance. This means that the consciousness that is imprinted into the durance is forced to relive the horrors of having their body disintegrated by neural physical energy streams while simultaneously extracting their mental pattern. On top of this, the free will of the personality is then overwritten with digital construct code and forced to do the bidding of the foreigners, in some cases turning against their own species and slaughtering allies with no ability to stop themselves. Even if consciousness doesn't continue after death and the original being is actually dead, this copy of the original being still appears to be self-aware and thus has to realise in some capacity the realities I've just highlighted. This isn't just disturbing, it's fundamentally sick. A cryptum is a sealed capsule where a high-ranking foreigner would enter self-imposed exile, 
often as a punishment for failure or dishonor. In this regard, the individual could be regarded as acting on their own volition. But again, these exiles were often enacted as a consequence of public shaming in the eyes of the other rates and the Ecumene Council. Backroom dealings, manipulation and political agendas often highlighted individuals with enough influence as to be an inhibiting factor to achieving goals that the controlling parties would otherwise wish to see accomplished. An excuse was often then fabricated or events influenced to shame an individual, forcing the otherwise honor-bound individual into a self-imposed exile, thereby effectively removing them as an obstacle to the other party's interests. This happened with the Erdidact as a consequence of posing a significant obstacle to the Master Builder's plans to reform the Ecumen Council to having the Builder Rate as the most powerful and influential rate. The reason that the Cryptum is disturbing is because the individual would be prepared for exile by undergoing a ritual and consuming Injikoa, a chemical designed to desiccate the physical body of the individual. They would then be locked within the Cryptum a millennial seal imposed and activated, preserving the mind of the individual indefinitely, but keeping the body in a vitrified state, devoid of practically any moisture. The mind of the one within is said to be linked directly to the domain. During this time, the mind of the occupant can wander endlessly within the domain. This, to many, is a daunting concept. But worse than this is if, as with the Erdidact, the domain wasn't active when placed within his cryptum. In which case, the occupant spends however long the cryptum is locked, trapped within their own mind, unable to interact with anyone, cry for help, move, or do anything to otherwise spare their mind of the possible eons of solace. This is a crime worse than death, because at least death has an end. When or if the person is awoken, their body is as close to a mummified corpse as is possible to be, and if not given reviving fluids and a bath of fluids to continue the recovery, the individual likely wouldn't have the strength to continue living, slowly choking and suffocating to death as their bodies lack any moisture and thus any ability to move, even down to the lungs and heart. Reseeding was performed across the galaxy as a contingency to restore life to a galaxy after the halo array was fired. But in order to catalogue species for reseeding, the foreigners needed to gather genetic material, sex cells, and live physical specimens of every species catalogued. In this regard, the foreigners would have acted at this time in a similar manner to the stories we hear of alien abductions. Humans, for example, would likely be held in captivity, with surgical procedures performed to extract genetic material, sperm and egg cells, and some individuals would be abducted altogether and sealed within hard light containment units. These would be time-locked metal monolith type structures, the individual being placed inside and the device activated, sealing the being inside in a kind of suspended animation. They would then be transported to the Ark, where, at least in some cases, they'd be let out, having to somehow come to terms about being on an alien construct far beyond the rim of the galaxy, bearing in mind at this stage humanity had been devolved to being that of cavemen again. Their minds would thus be utterly incapable of comprehending what had happened and where they were. After the firing of the array, these individuals would be forced back into containment units and transported back to their now empty homeworld. They'd be released onto the planet and then abandoned. No explanation as to why or what happened to all of their loved ones, just left on a receded but otherwise sterile world. Catalogue was the name given to a collective entity within the foreigner juridical rate. Catalogue was charged with recording, observing, and uploading information to the juridical network. Juridicals were charged with the investigation of criminal activities by citizens of the foreigner ecumene, and as such were important aspects of the foreigner's legal system. There were hundreds of individuals identified as catalogue, 
Despite being individuals, once a foreigner took on the role of catalogue, they were simply all referred to as the singular being catalogue. Each individual foreigner connected to catalogue was encased in a coffin-like mechanical carapace. It granted the foreigner within optimum observation and recording capabilities, thus facilitating their roles as information records, and allowing it to interview quickly and efficiently while contacting the network as often as necessary. The coffin-like carapace is where things start to turn weird. When assuming the carapace, the biological body of the fauna was reduced into a shriveled, misshapen form in a similar manner to the cryptum, the catalogue carapace only needing the mind of the occupant to function and leaving the body's requirements as non-essential. The carapace also acted as life support systems for the withered body within. Generally speaking, the foreigner within was a shamed individual and was somewhat forced to become a catalogue, a more openly accepted way of dealing with problem individuals than the cryptum, but no less unpleasant. If a member of catalogue chose to disconnect from the carapace, their body would be so weak, withered, malformed and incapable, it would suffocate, which was, unsettlingly, considered an honourable death in the event of failure. Again, this sounds to me as a fate worse than death, confined to a coffin-like device tasked with simply recording events, all individuality removed in place of a singular, objectified title of catalogue, knowing that if you really wanted out you could disconnect yourself but ultimately simply suffocate to death as a consequence. After a long enough time period of servitude to the ecumene and the juridicals, this fate, I'm sure, would begin looking ever more preferable to their waking reality. The Composer was obviously going to be on this list. The Composer is a device powered by neural physics, a concept mastered by the precursors but only partially understood by the foreigners, that translates a being's mind into machine data to be used for varying purposes. The original design included using it on older foreigners to transfer their minds into younger bodies, thereby facilitating a kind of immortality. Later, the idea of simply mind uploading and translating the mind to a sentient machine or directly to the domain was pursued and eventually was conceived as a way to cure a flood infection. None of these functions achieved any semblance of long-term success. The process was highly flawed, likely due to the foreigner's lack of complete understanding of the nature of neural physics. In addition to being extremely painful to the individuals undergoing the process, all attempts to restore the essences to biological form failed as artificial bodies would quickly decay and inevitably die. The physical effects of the composer on its target were also violent. The device projected a beam of powerful energy which completely reduces the target individuals to ash in a rather gruesome manner, burning away their skin muscle and bones in an agonizing sequence that is quite obviously terrifying to experience firsthand. This is definitely one of the foreigners more disturbing practices. After being disintegrated, the being would still have to experience their mind being transferred and converted and ultimately then being used by the foreigners will to enact actions they have no control over. The halo effect, the firing of the array, it is difficult to grasp the sheer level of destruction that this galaxy spanning super weapon can cause. The actual overlapping pulse from the array would target the nervous systems of all sentient species and destroy them. It is reasoned that the composer has something to do with this, as it appears that composers are a fundamental aspect of a halo's firing mechanism. The pulse appears to simply destroy the central nervous system altogether, likely with high energy particles that resonate at the same frequency as neural networks. This would basically be like experiencing extreme, instantly fatal levels of radiation exposure but it only damaging your nervous system. 
destroying everything that can be considered the conscious version of you, leaving behind an empty corpse. The halo ray doesn't disintegrate the leftover biomass, and as such, the foreigners would employ the use of a solute that would dissolve the bodies into the component molecules. In our normal lives, we are unfortunately familiar with extinction. We have caused the extinction of some species. Further to this, we can at least comprehend a planetary-wide extinction-level event. The asteroid which wiped out the dinosaurs is a prime example of an extinction-level event that destroyed over 75% of all life on Earth. But now, scale this up. Our planet is a single habitable planet orbiting a main sequence star. There are 100 billion stars in our galaxy, with an estimated 50% of them, with planets in the habitable zone around their host star. Imagine causing the complete 100% extinction of all sentient life in the galaxy. This is what the Fauronas did. And despite their contingency plan to receive the galaxy, there is no way in hell they actually managed to catalogue and index every sentient species in the galaxy. Meaning, there are swathes of species made extinct that will never be seen again. The Forerunners were a massively powerful race. They had a galaxy-spanning empire and some of the galaxy's most impressive megastructures. Yet as the scale and power of a species grows, so does the risk that species poses to the rest of life. The Forerunners grew to such an extent as to be the galaxy's best chance of surviving something as horrible as the Flood. But their ego and their ignorance led them to being one of the biggest threats to life across the galaxy. There are lessons to be learned here. Humanity have grown extremely fast over the past 100,000 years, and terrifyingly fast in the past 200. We have grown to be a powerful species, and our scale has grown to cover every continent of Earth. With that power and with that growth, we are the Earth's best chance at survival into the future. But we are also the biggest threat to Earth's continued survival. So let's learn from the Fauna's failures. An endeavour not to destroy our one and only home. Thanks for watching. Stick your comments down below. I look forward to what you have to say. It's a pretty dark and heavy episode, but I enjoyed writing it at least. I want to give a shout out to my patrons, Neek the Silent Cartographer, Brian, Sebastian, Red Sea, Darian, Stork of the Realms, Falcon X003, Alvin, DW, Flaming Halo and the Revanche, the Holders of the Mantle, my glorious reclaimers, my loyal metarchs and all of the other patrons that have jumped aboard to support the channel. You guys are awesome and all of this would not be possible without you. If you like Halo Lore Discussed to Insane Loves of Detail, hit that subscribe button and the little bell icon so you're told the second a new video hits the shelves. Be sure to support us on all major social media channels, including Discord, and if you really love the channel, consider heading over to Patreon and supporting the channel over there. It would mean the world to me, and would free up more of my time for me to put into this content and other Halo-related goodness. Take it easy, everyone, and find peace in the domain.